Folkens, hej och välkommen till en ny episode av Power Ladies. Podcasten hvor jeg, Ørøya, intervjuer damer som utmerker sig innenfor det de holder på med for å gi deg litt tools og tactics som du selv kan ta i bruk i eget liv. Denne episoden er bitte litt annerledes. Det er faktisk min aller første live podcast. Jeg må si jeg var egentlig ganske nervøs og bekymret for hvordan det skulle gå, men det gikk superfint fordi hun jeg intervjuet snakket som en foss i de 30 minuttene som vi hadde på scenen. Så det var jo egentlig litt flaks. Etter dette intervjuet så har jeg blitt litt mer komfortabel med å gjøre ting live, så det er nice. Intervjuet er med Silicon Valley Queen Roswana Bashir, og blev gjort på Future Talks konferansen i Oslo rett etter sommeren, hvor blant annet jeg snakket på scene, samme scene som Prince Ia og skaperen bak den anerkjente HBO-tv-serien, ja, Westworld. Pretty crazy, ja. Eh, og så det var altså en internasjonal konferanse hvor eh, det blev diskutert fremtidstrender og problemstillinger. Så alt var jo selvfølgelig på engelsk, inkludert denne praten her. Så det er kanskje litt uvant, men ja, da kan du forberede dig litt på fremtiden, fordi målet mitt er jo på et eller annet tidspunkt. Det kan ikke si når, men det blir nok en stund til å intervjue folk på engelsk. All right. Så, dagens gjest, Roswana. Hun imponerer mig helt sinnssykt, og jeg håper at du hører igenom det, selv om det er på norsk, fordi hun her er i verdensklasse. Fullt navn, Roswana Bashir, som jeg nevnte, Silicon Valley Queen, og hun har også blitt kåret til en av Fortune's Most Powerful Women og Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People. Ja, ganske prestisjetunge kåringer, for å si det sånn. Hun startet selskapet Peak.com i 2014, og her kan folk finne og boke opplevelser verden over, som alt fra å svømme med hei og cooking classes og... Og så er det en software som får da reiseoperatører til å komme online og bli synlige. Og for denne startupen så har hun fått svimlende 40 millioner dollar i funding. Og for å si det eh, i norske tall, så er det nesten 350 millioner kroner for en startup. Altså i, altså i funding, nemlig det å... Åh, hva er det på norsk? Eh, det er når du søker om på en måte støtte til å starte opp eh, bedriften din, rett og slett fra investorer. Så de pengene har hun fått av grunnerne bak Eric Schmidt og Twitters Jack Dorsey. Og det er... Ja, det er en grad av funding som de fleste startups i Norge egentlig ikke kan relatere til. Og før, før peak så jobbet Roswana for det kjente selskapet Goldman Sachs og The Blackstone Group. Og hun har en MBA fra Harvard Business School og en grad i filosofi, politik og økonomi fra Oxford. En annen grunn til at Roswana imponerer meg um, så sykt, det er at i 2014 så skrev hun en artikel i The Guardian som gikk viralt og gjorde verdenskjent, hvor hun fortalte om opplevelsen om å bli seksuelt misbrukt i det britisk-pakistanske communityet som hun kom fra. Uh, og hun fortalte at uh, på grund av skam og tabu så er det Ja, det er helt uvanlig egentlig å si fra om disse tingene. Selv om familien, familiene for eksempel vet om det, så er det ingen som eh, sier fra. Og den artikkelen ble skrevet i lys av eh, 2014 etter forskningene hvor det ble avdekket at 1400 barn hadde blitt seksuelt misbrukt i Rotterham innen noen få år eh, periode i England. Ved å skrive den artikkelen så riskerte hun jo relasjonene med familien, men hun gjorde det likevel fordi hun mente at det var 
det är er väldigt viktigt att belysa uh, denna saken uh, för att andra ska få det bättre. Så Rosanna bränner för var en stämme och rollmodell för muslimska kvinnor och hennes mission det är er rätt och slett om minska lidelse i världen, skapa fler möjligheter för folk och inspirera till glädje. Så all right, modig och resursstark dame med andra ord. Uh, Så i episoden så får man höra om Rosanna som entreprenör. Det var egentligen det med fick tid och möjlighet. Te. Så let me know what you think. <laughs> Enjoy. Welcome Rosanna. Hi there. <laughs> it's an incredible story. Yeah. Uh, we're so glad to uh, to have you here even though we couldn't offer you like the blow dryer in the morning. <laughs> So, um, first question is, uh, what's your morning routine uh, like? Like, just to start, oh, really yeah. simple. Oh wow, um, I wasn't expecting that one. Um, my mo- I don't really. Uh, I was like, oh, I'm not prepared in any way. Um, I am. Um, I'm going to have to admit that I don't have any routines in life. Um, I think one of the things about being an entrepreneur is that um, I might have to get up at like four in the morning to do a call if I have to, or or it might be that you know I'm here and uh, and and get to wake up at a reasonable hour. So I I actually one of the things um, I'm used to is not having any kind of routine. So I might work for 20 hours a day, um, and the next day I might be on a trip or a vacation. So I think the flexibility um, is there um, so that the routine doesn't exist. It's not very healthy because you don't do a lot of exercise and you might not sleep as much as you want. But um, I don't personally, I don't need routines in order to be able to uh, like function. And if anything, I want the flexibility of being able to make the most of every opportunity. And that might be with work or with something else. So um, it doesn't exist. The only things I'm routine about are when I go to restaurants and I order the exact same thing again and again. Yeah. <laughs> My friends think that's weird. But, I um, often do the same but, as well. Uh, but, but everything else has no routine whatsoever. So um, when you went to Oxford, you actually then changed your outfit um, to Western clothes for the very first time. How did that feel like and why did you do it? Uh, yeah, so I, I grew up in a very small community. And so I, uh, my parents are originally from Pakistan. Um, I moved from, you know, my, they, they moved from Pakistan to the UK in a wave of immigration that we had uh, in the 50s and 60s. Um, and so they came from a very small, very conservative community. And so I grew up in an environment where actually, um, you know, although I was growing up in England, ostensibly everybody around me was Pakistani. So every house, all my neighbors were all Pakistani. And so that meant that they really uh, kept a lot of the original kind of values and, and, and ideas. And part of that was dress. And so I uh, I didn't wear Western clothes till I was 18 and I left home. Until then I wore traditional shawal kameez uh, and, you know, covered my hair and, and, and wore kind of traditional Pakistani clothes. And, and that, you know, that environment and growing up there actually probably gave me a, a great perspective about very two different worlds, um, growing up in a Pakistani community, which which ostensibly was little Pakistan, through to being in the UK, which obviously has very, very different contests. Um, and so, um, you know, when I, I was fortunate because I, um, although no one in my community was getting um, a lot of access to education, especially women, um, it was very patriarchal. Um, I was fortunate because I did quite well at school. And in doing well at school, I, um, I had a teacher who had gone to Cambridge. Um, and uh, that really inspired me to to, to try to apply. And so I went, I applied to Oxford without telling my parents um, because I knew that that probably wasn't something that they wanted me to do. Um, but I, then I got in and I was the only kid in my community that had ever gotten into Oxford. And so my parents let me go. Um, and that kind of opportunity to go from this very small place where my dad sold fruit and vegetables, my mom didn't work, my mom still doesn't speak English after 40 years in England, um, to go from that place where frankly nobody I knew had ever gone to anything like that uh, and get to go to Oxford completely changed my life. And one, one aspect of that is that you know I was able to perhaps you know uh, liberalize a little bit more in terms of dress so like lots of dresses instead of uh, instead of shawar um but also um was able to get this huge access to opportunity that I'd never thought of before um I think um my world was so limited before I went to Oxford um and getting to Oxford meant that I suddenly knew that there was uh, you know, there were Nobel Prize winners and there were, there were you know, amazing politicians or whatever it was. Um, it was very, very inspiring for me to increase my um, perception of the opportunity in the world. We also became the president of the Oxford uh, Society. No, union, yeah. yeah. Union, yeah. Yeah, union, which is a famous uh, debating society uh, all over the world, actually, which presidents have gone to as well. 
Um, and uh, then you got a promising career in finance with, in Goldman Sachs and the Black, uh, the Black Group. But uh, what made you switch gears to start your own company and go to Silicon Valley? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, I kind of, coming from a slightly different background, it meant that I felt the need to tick a lot of boxes. And so I kind of needed to show people that I was smart and I could do that, uh, could, could do a good job. And so I went in, in a very traditional career format, so investment banking and then private equity. Um, and that was great in the sense that it gave me a lot of skills um, that, I, that I felt were very important to build my own business. I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, but It was, it was not so good in the sense that I didn't feel like I was creating value. Um, so there's a lot of value capture because um, you're able to buy companies and, and change them around, but there's, um, there's not the feeling of creating. Um, and so for me, um, that was not compelling and interesting. So I basically moved to America to go to Harvard Business School um, and started to get really interested in entrepreneurship. And so I ended up being fortunate enough to work in a couple of startups in New York, um, got the bug around Silicon Valley and decided to move with one suitcase to Silicon Valley with an idea I had uh, to start hopefully building a company. And it's thankfully worked out quite well, um, but it was a bit of a risky, risky idea. Yeah. So how, how did the idea come about? Like how, how uh, did Peak start it? Yeah, so um, I went to Istanbul for a weekend um, with some friends, and uh, I, uh, I basically spent 20 hours planning the trip. Um, and that was not, I mean, although it was fun to know that you were going to have this great experience, I was only there for three days, and so that 20-hour commitment felt like a bit much. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I'd, I was researching great things to do and trying to figure out um, you know, who would be a great experience to have it with, you know, the, finding the guides and the experiences. Um, and I just didn't understand why it wasn't something I could just go online and easily book. Um, what I recognized and as I started digging into it, it was uh, clear that a lot of the businesses in this space, it's about a $150 billion market globally, really hadn't come online. Um, so whereas you might have had open table for restaurants, bringing all of those online, um, you know, you've got booking.com for hotels, but you really didn't have anything for activities and experiences. And so I decided to start working on the idea to bring them online and make it very easy for consumers to book experiences. Um, it also resonated with me personally, and I think we're in a generation which has really changed our outlook and how we want to spend our time. Um, there was an era, you know, where we all bought cars and houses and a lot of the products that we bought defined our identity. Today, I think we are a very different kind of society, especially millennials, who want to spend their time doing experiences, things that uh, help them create, help them get inspired, help them actually, you know, learn new things. And so um, what was really powerful for me is um, we think about connecting the world through experiences. So how do we ensure that when people go to a new country or a new place, they can really interact with it and have an opportunity to build empathy by learning about a new culture through to just having a great experience with their friends or family um, and those connections. So um, what was really exciting for me was to see, okay, this is a huge market. It's not got any big players yet. Let's bring it online, but let's also do, for me, a job that's very fulfilling because we get to inspire joy and happiness for people. So uh, clearly, you're not a white male. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so not last time I checked. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what are some of the challenges you've been uh, you've been facing in Silicon Valley as a female minority tech entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think you know the Valley does get a little bit more uh, flack than most areas for having um, not having a great representation of women, and I think. Unfortunately, that is the case. I think a lot of other industries have that problem too. Um, um, I think a lot of the problems actually stem from funding. Um, so, you know, only about 2% of venture-backed companies are uh, have female founders and CEOs. And so I think there is a very natural thing when investors meet entrepreneurs that they have kind of some pattern matching. And if you don't fit into that pattern, and, and, and a lot of this is subconscious, you know, it's not that we mean, any of us mean to kind of connect better with people who look like us, but that happens. And I think sometimes that means that when women are presented with opportunities, they're not, um, you know, and, and go out and try and get investment, they're not necessarily getting the same treatment and opportunity that, you know, someone who's a white male might. Um, I think that it is getting better. I think we've had some moments in entrepreneurship where people recognize that and are trying to change some of that. Um, also, I think, frankly, we have a huge issue with not enough women starting businesses. So we don't have enough women that go into technology education, or and we don't create a society which really inspires women to be able to create those things. So I think a lot of the opportunity that we have now is around helping 
um, mentor women who might want to be entrepreneurs uh, and be leaders, uh, as well as actually, you know, looking at young women and young girls that might be in school still through to university and actually inspiring them that this is a route um, and that not everybody who starts a Silicon Valley tech company um, looks a certain way and they could they could do that. So I think we definitely need better role models as well. Do you have a favorite like struggle of yours in Sil- your time in Silicon Valley? Um, you know, not, not a favorite because the struggles have never been that fun. Yeah, but, but okay, but like it, yeah, but the it, one you like to tell or yeah, something. yeah. No, I mean, I think I think I think that in the end, um, there's probably like. It, the nature of startups is that it's a roller coaster. So I think before we started, you said, oh, well, what's it been like to spend $40 million, dollars? you know, half yeah. all that money? Well, it turns out it doesn't, you don't get it like that, right? You get it in these small batches and and there's this constant fear of survival because you're like, well, I've got all these people that are working for me and they're relying on us being able to build this, you know, multi-billion dollar, like, you know, world-changing uh, company. And, you know, we might not be able to pay the bills in three months. So I think um, a lot of the challenges I actually think actually come from things like funding, um, which, which, because everything else is a little bit more in your control. And I think uh, as entrepreneurs, you know, we found product market fit. So today we have hundreds of millions of dollars of bookings through our platform for activities. Uh, we work with thousands of businesses. Um, we serve millions of customers. Um, and so actually the product really works. People love that. But being able to translate that into ensuring that investors or other partners want to work with you is harder. So, you know, we now work with Yelp. Um, we've got a partnership uh, with Reserve with Google, which will allow you to be able to search for activities on Yelp and Google and, and be able to book them through Peak. So those kind of things, I think, Um, are all have been probably the biggest challenges have been able to persuade people that you're credible, um, both to find access to resources, but also get these partnerships um, so that you can get access to wider distribution. So I think those have been the biggest challenges. And then more more generally, it's just about building a team. Um, you know, I this is my first startup, so I didn't necessarily know uh, how to do a lot of things. And, uh, and, and frankly, you just make a lot of mistakes and you have to be comfortable with that. And I think especially as the CEO, um, the phases of the company are so different when you've got 15 people um, through to having a much larger team um, and having to, to kind of scale yourself up. Um, so that has been um, both challenging and fun, actually. Do you have any favorite uh, advice uh, for uh, female founders? Like, do you have any advice? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the biggest thing I'd say is before you even become female founders, it's about um, taking risks. So I think one thing um, that's been important for me in my career is being willing to take risks um, that might not pay off. And, and I think, you know, famously, there's, there's other people that say that. Eric Schmidt's one of my investors. And, and, and you know, the, the big story at Google was always, you know, it's a rocket ship, get on, don't care about the position. Um, and I think that is very true. And I think being willing to take risks in your career that might not pay off for, and frankly, that you don't feel you're ready for, are very important. I think one of the big disconnects we have with, with men and women often is that women are not as willing to, to put themselves forward for things that they don't feel they're already prepared for. Um, actually, we do have to do that because that's when you grow and you challenge yourself and you have a ton of personal development. So I think most of it for me is around, you might not think you're ready for something and it's pretty scary, but you should still jump in and do it. Um, I think more generally beyond women, I think it's actually saying to all the men in the room, um, try and make sure that you're mentoring women. Um, mentorship is being, has been shown to be one of the big ways in which people have the support to move forward. And, um, and I think, you know, certainly coming to Silicon Valley, not really knowing anyone uh, and, uh, and not really necessarily feeling like I connected with people. It was kind of hard, you know, you've got a different accent, you look different. Um, and it was hard to connect with people. Um, and I think that that was, you know, it would have, I've never really had necessarily mentors. Um, and it would have been really amazing to have that and have people to look to for advice. Um, and I think that comes from women and men, actually, because, um, you know, frankly, there, there aren't enough women in senior leadership positions. So we actually need men to step up. And that leadership takes a few things. It's, it's more than just, you know, often, um, You know, you'll have men go out for drinks in the evening and, and perhaps women in a group might not be included, uh, especially now that we've had some some things come out with, uh, you know, Me Too and other things. People are a little bit more cautious, but um, it's okay to not go for drinks with women, but then you better make sure that you're going for breakfasts and lunches and other environments um, and you're actually treating the men and women in your team equally. So I think that today we have an opportunity to allow more access, not only for women, but also minority groups. One of the areas that is really underserved um, is African-Americans and Hispanics in the US and that's a huge opportunity for us to do more. So I think um, it's really taking the people who have huge potential and putting um, energy and effort behind mentoring them. 
<laughs> Time flies. Crazy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I then I just start right on this question. It like we might not have time uh, for it, but uh, I mentioned the article that uh, you wrote in 2014 yeah. about the uh, sexual abuse and um, the Rotterdam report. Why did ra- you write it? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. So <laughs> in one minute, here, totally. um, <laughs> two minutes. Um, um, so um, you know, I, uh, the context is just that I, I think we've we've had. Um, you know, Me Too come come through, but about a few years ago, you know, I, as somebody who was able to get a very big opportunity to, um, you know, improve my life and go to Oxford and do all these things, um, had actually been abused, um, you know, when I was growing up by somebody in my community. Um, and so I ended up going back after finishing HBS uh, and pursuing a criminal case against my abuser. Um, and so he ended up going to jail for five and a half years. And um, and so I kind of actually did that very privately. And it was something that I frankly didn't talk to anyone about, including my good friends. Um, and then something happened in the UK, the Rotherham Report, which was pretty... Um, um, pretty big for the UK around abuse of children, predominantly by Pakistani men. And so uh, I felt a real moral obligation to speak up because, frankly, especially women uh, and women from kind of Muslim communities or Pakistani communities found it quite difficult to overcome cultures of shame in order to be able to talk about abuse. And so having been somebody who had seen it happen in my own community and it's in the positive impact, uh, there have been two or three other young women who had come out in my community about being abused after uh, my court case. And so... I felt there was an opportunity and a moral obligation to speak out. And so I ended up writing an article for The Guardian, which uh, The Guardian published in that front page. And it was, you know, shared uh, and uh, read by a million people. And uh, that allowed me to be able to start having um, a voice for areas that were perhaps outside of my original domain, but allowed me to hopefully have a positive impact. And, and, And that was a, quite good for me because it allowed me to be more authentic in in who I am and to talk about an issue that's actually pretty important. Um, But second, it also allowed me to be able to um, help others. And so um, one thing that was kind of very surprising about that article um, was just how many people I heard from, but they weren't the people that I expected. I expected Muslims or people from similar communities to be reaching out to me. In the end, I heard from everybody from all over the world, men and women. So it might be somebody from Nigeria, it might be somebody from Japan, Switzerland. And I actually realized these cultures of shame around abuse existed everywhere. So my perception had been very much, oh, maybe this is an issue and these are the specific things we need to do within the context of the Pakistani community or the Muslim community. Actually, it turns out, and we see this with the Catholic church and and a lot of, uh, you know, there's been some revelations in Pennsylvania about about a thousand kids being abused by um, priests in in the US. Um, This is actually pretty pervasive. And so for me, um, it made me realize just how much suffering we have in the world around these issues because we don't talk about it and because people feel very isolated and very alone. And so my opportunity, and I think, you know, it was a moment for me to be able to share something that allowed me to connect a lot more with people. Um, And so I heard stories from lots of people. There were many people that I knew that started court cases themselves to prosecute abuse um, and uh, were able, I think, to feel a lot more empowered. And so, um, you know, it was, it was my, it was before Me Too happened, but I was not surprised when the Me Too movement happened because I'd heard from so many people about their harassment or their, their abuse. Um, so I think we are in a turning point um, where we're willing to talk about these issues and I think therefore start to move to eradicate them as well. Mm. Um, we got some more minutes for uh, questions, um, but one last que- question from me. Like, why did you say yes to go to this trip to Svalbard? Um, well, I do do activities as my job. And so the idea of going on an Arctic adventure and getting to see polar bears, I felt was both, you know, probably helping my, my work whilst also being an incredible adventure and fun to have. Yeah. Um, also, I think that, um, you know, I, I very much agree with Celia that um, you have to have cross, cross-disciplinary approaches to tackle the problems of the day. I think um, when you are an entrepreneur or working in technology, it can be very easy to just focus on what you're doing. Um, but we all have an obligation to make the world better, right? Ultimately, I think we've been very lucky to any of us to be in this room. Um, I certainly feel incredibly fortunate to have the journey that I've had. And so part of that journey journey is being able to give back to others. And so um, I do think there are some really big challenging problems that we can all contribute to. And I'm excited to be able to do that over the next few days. Great. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? No? Oh, yes. Yes. How many 
partners do you have around the world who actually are? And, and what's, if there is an average size, what's the average size of that company that now finds a home on your platform? Um, great question. So we work with thousands of businesses. Today, they're primarily in the U.S. and in Mexico because we've got mo most of our bases in the U.S. Um, and that's about a $30 billion market. Um, and so um, the businesses that we work with provide services that range from zip lining or whitewater rafting. Right now, we don't have any polar bears, but we do have dog sledding, um, if you guys want to do that. Um, and so um, we, ha we haven't made it to Europe yet. Um, most of the businesses are actually very small. Um, they, they do a few hundred thousand to a few million dollars of bookings. And they're typically really entrepreneurs. And one of the things that we've seen is that, um, especially these kind of segments, um, people don't, aren't very sophisticated with technology. And so a lot of them hadn't made the move online because frankly, it was so intimidating, right? So I might've had a family business where for 50 years, we've been the best people to provide hot air balloon rides in the area that we, we're in. Um, but I don't know how I do online booking or how I find customers who are all now coming to mobile phones and looking for things. And so um, a lot of what we've been doing is empowering those businesses by providing all the technology backend. Um, and so today we work with thousands of businesses. And over time, what we are beginning to see is a lot of people coming for globally and asking to use our software. Typically, we actually say no because we don't serve anyone that doesn't speak English or a lot of other currencies. Um, but we we already have m businesses that say, we're okay with that. We're in China. We have a great food tour or we're in Addis Ababa. Or, so we've got merchants that are all over the world today. Um, but I'm excited about the next journey. So part of the thing is that in the last few months, we've um, we raised uh, and some more capital and we'll be utilizing that in order to be able to continue to democratize access to entrepreneurship, but also experiences. Um, I think one thing I'd say also is that the businesses we work with, a lot of them are actually new businesses. Um, I think we have a wave of people who have kind of recognized that um, we all want to spend our time doing things that are experiential. Um, and so they're creating concepts that didn't exist before. Um, one of them is an escape room concept. I'm sure mm. you guys have all been to them. They didn't exist like three years ago, right? And now probably with most cities, uh, there's some kind of escape room where you can go and do these fun puzzles with your friends. Um, and so I think you're really going to see a whole new group of experiences emerge, um, which I think is really exciting. Yes, all the way in the back. Yeah, thanks for sharing your story. Uh, but how do you ensure quality in these vendors? And if I, I'm kind of similar to you. I've been 20 hours before. How many days I spend before I try to make it unique for me and calling my friends, blah, blah, blah. I go to your website, and I see, like, everyone's going on this website and going on this trip, and I meet people, and I talk to them, and I want to relate to, or, like, I want to do this unique for myself. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so just to make sure everyone kind of heard that as well, um, you know, just asking about how do you, how do we make sure the quality is there and how do you make sure it's the right thing for you? Um, and we're recommending, um, the right things that you would want to do based on your own interests. Um, and I think that's exactly the problem that I identified as well. Um, actually what we do is because we work with thousands of businesses, we collect huge amounts of data around the experiences. So we've collected over half a million reviews on the businesses, on every activity, by customers who definitely did the tour. So by owning the underlying in technology, we're able to get feedback from every single customer about what's going on. That feedback's useful for you as a consumer. It's actually useful for the businesses as well because they're like, oh, wow, like uh, this tour is not performing very well or this guide isn't doing a great job and it's gotten much lower uh, reviews. So what we found is that that is actually very powerful because you've got data that is from individual customers. We also personalize. So one of the things you'll see in our app or, or uh, on the website is that you can go in and uh, there's a series of pictures uh, you can select between do you want to go uh, you know, car racing or do you want to do a food tour and from that we're able to infer your preferences and so we can start personalizing and giving you things that are relevant to what you want we even also have themes so you know, it might be things to do with kids um, and the last thing that we've done is we have a, a section called Perfect Days, um, which is uh, ideas from people that you might know or, or connect with, um, giving you ideas on cool things that they like to do in, their, in cities that they love. And so that might be um, a fashion designer like Diane von Furstenberg or Tori Birch giving you tips on what they like to do all the way through to, you know, a writer or, uh, you know, a journalist. So we, we kind of, um, we get those perspectives from people. Um, you know, it might be a chef like Wolfgang Puck telling you what he likes to do in, in LA. And so uh, by getting those perspectives, we can ho also hopefully layer in um, some feedback from influencers that you might respect and like as well. So that works very well. 
Yeah. I, I, I'm just like really thank you, I guess, for, for your talks. I'm super inspired. And oh, I, thank you. I found, I guess, more clarity on the things that I wanted to do based on what you said. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I guess my question is less uh, about Peak and I guess more about you. And um, I was just wondering, what's this, uh, you mentioned that you were from a community and you were basically the first one to go to Oxford to do something that was different. Um, I was just wondering, like, what do you consider your best qualities for you to have been able to do that and do other uh, things that kind of broke the boundaries, something that um, was never that you never saw was possible? Right? Yeah, um, thank you. That's very kind. Um, so, so I think um, I think um, for, for me, I, I, I was quite fortunate in the sense that um, you know. I had a certain amount of horsepower to be able to do lots of different things well. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, you definitely need that. I don't think I'm excellent at anything, but I'm pretty good at most things, which means that I can figure things out. And that's a very good quality as an entrepreneur. I think actually coming from a pretty adverse background meant that I've actually been quite used to fighting to try and, and, and make things work. So I'm not actually very afraid of failure um, because frankly, like I've failed lots and lots of times <laughs> and the path has not been easy. And I think that comfort with knowing that something might not work out um, makes a big difference in the resilience and persistence. So I'm pretty sure that even if something didn't work out 10 times, I would be optimistic enough to jump back up again and say, let's give it another go, right? Um, so I think the, the, the adverse circumstances, I think that can sometimes prevent other people from doing it are also incredibly useful for entrepreneurship. There's lots of other careers I probably wouldn't be very good at, and I don't think I'd be very good at working for someone else anymore. Um, but um, I think all of the things that, that, that kind of helped me prepare were, were there to be a great entrepreneur because um, you don't take no for an answer. You, you're willing to push, and um, it's okay feeling like an outsider. I, I think I felt like an outsider my whole life, and, and that's okay. Like, you can walk into a room and think, look, I'm not sure I'm like everyone else, but that's fine. And hopefully people who look at me um, and don't feel like they're like someone everyone else can think oh well I'm not the only one um, you know today I think one of the things uh, for me has been that you know there are a, a, almost a billion Muslim women right and yet when it comes to role models for those women there's very very few and I think that there's an opportunity I hope to say to share with others that might have come from my background or might have had you know might have suffered abuse who kind of feel like they don't belong to know that actually you do and um, there's lots and lots of different faces and, and backgrounds that can allow you to be successful and have impact. So I definitely feel an obligation to help everybody else feel that way, whatever you look like or whatever background you've had. Have you had any role models? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 this is potentially quite cheesy, but I, I think Oprah Winfrey is amazing. Um, I think that for me, um, her story was really inspiring because she didn't. She came from a pretty adverse scenario. Um, she didn't necessarily fit in. Um, and uh, I think she carved out a path for herself, um, which was really about authenticity um, and her being herself. And I think as you look today, I think one of the impacts she's been able to have is, is encourage other people to be much more authentic whilst also having a very positive impact on her own community. So she's somebody, actually, it's funny because when I was at Harvard Business School, we genuinely had a case study on her. And I was like, great, seven pages of just why Oprah Winfrey is amazing. Um, and so um, I think someone like that is very, very inspiring, all the way through to, I guess, traditional business leaders um, who are awesome. And, and, you know, perhaps, you know, the Buddha and, 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 uh, and others who have been very thoughtful and inspiring in what they do uh, for us uh, in terms of philosophical uh, approaches. Okay, we have one minute left. Like, what drives you, you? What's your mission? Like, where are you in 10 years, for example? Uh, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, my, my mission, I, I think, is uh, to decrease suffering, uh, to increase opportunity, um, and to inspire joy. So those are the big things for me uh, that are really important. And so I think when I look at myself in 10 years, um, you know, I hope that we've inspired a lot of joy uh, with Peak. Um, whenever we look at the millions of bookings, we're kind of like, well, I think on average, there must be at least one smile per experience. So I, uh, <laughs> I try to think about millions of smiles that we can give people. And then I think in terms of decreasing suffering and increasing opportunity, you know, I've been very fortunate you know, given where I was at, there were not a lot of opportunities. I really feel an obligation to help others increase their opportunity. Um, so I think I'll be doing more things around that, um, both in terms of peak, but also other, uh, other work that I might do um, in terms of activism, activism and, and other things. So um, that's my mission, and I'm really excited to continue doing it. Hopefully not just for 10 years, but for, for as, as long as I live, and hopefully we're in the age of potentially living a lot longer than, than others have. 
Great. Okay, you're extremely inspiring and you're Thank extremely you. courageous. Like that's courage is your personality <laughs> summed up. Okay. Um, thank you for sharing your story and uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. <laughs> okay. Wow. For a dame, and she means so sweet, well formulated. Tusen tack för att du hört på den episoden och om du likt den del gärna med någon andra eller lägg like en review det hade made my day. och uh, Rosanna kan du följa på sociala medier och det kan du med Pik och och jag önskar dig en fantastisk dag vidare och jag hoppas du blir inspirerad. Mer nästa episode. 